All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I just want to share a little bit more about uh, what Bleximo is doing. Um, but let me start by um, essentially reminding you or telling you about the computers that got us to the moon. So, you know, in case uh, you know you've never looked this up, uh, the Apollo guidance computer actually only had a two megahertz clock and about two kilobytes of memory, and you know <laughs> that kind of sounds like nothing compared to what we have today. But that was really enough to get us to the moon. And the reason why it was possible was because back then, you know, the this entire system was essentially designed with that one purpose in mind. So, you know, in essence, it was an application-specific device. I, you know, when I mentioned the word application-specific, I don't. I'm not saying whether or not that device is universal, but instead I'm just saying that the device was designed and the, with essentially the software that will be running on it in mind. Okay, so hopefully that uh, gives us a little bit of hope uh, with quantum computing because as you all know, it's very early stages. But uh, okay, with that being said, let me tell you about what Bleximo does. So Bleximo is a full stack quantum computing company and what we're doing is building application specific quantum computers. So the entire idea is to integrate the algorithm development aspect with the processor design and the processor integration with classical computers. So more or less a specific application determines kind of what algorithm you would run and that in turn has some kind of qubit requirements, the, the gates that you would prefer to run it on, that kind of guides us to what the uh, processor architecture will be, which eventually produces a processor, and that processor has to be then integrated with the HPC system that might be running that system, class, at least the classical part of that system. So why, why did we decide to uh, go this route? Um, because naively, one would say that application-specific seems like something you should do later. But actually, it, you know, we, we believe that it's the other way around. Because you can essentially simplify the entire system by only focusing on a specific application. So there's essentially three reasons that we can highlight for why application-specific quantum computers make sense. The first one is speed. Um, by co-designing the processor with the algorithm that, it will be, that will be running on it, we can essentially cut the execution time by orders of magnitude, or at least one order of magnitude with the technology that we have today. So, you know, that might seem uh, like not a lot, but considering that quantum computers tend to have actually slower clocks than classical computers, you know, that's one way to improve that particular aspect of the technology. So the second, uh, the second reason is it lowers the complexity and costs of the entire system. So because we would because we're building devices that are targeting specific applications, we can essentially narrow the scope of everything around the system. It's not just the processor, but the control electronics and even, you know, again, the integration with the HPC system. That just reduces all the complexity, which allows us to build a system with much higher reliability. Um, and the final reason is important for commercial purposes it just has much higher um, IP security, essentially. So um, we know from learning from classical computing that pure algorithmic solutions are essentially easy to copy because you can rewrite the algorithm or, may, or make some modification. Um, but if you integrate your solution with a specific hardware, not only is it more, much more patentable and defensible in that regard, but it's also much easier to copy which you know, gives whatever company is using that a, you know, 
an advantage over its competitors. Okay, so I will, I will essentially go over the co-design approach, um, summarizing kind of the key aspects of it. So ultimately, our goal is to design the simplest possible hardware that can run a specific quantum algorithm. And we also want that hardware to integrate seamlessly into the classical workflow that is going to be uh, also contributing to that um, application. So essentially, the customer brings us an application, and that application in turn you know, determines what quantum algorithm would make sense to, uh, to for now, try out that application on. And that quantum algorithm essentially determines specifications that get passed on to the processor design team and the entire systems team that will then build a processor and deploy it. Now, I also want to emphasize here that we don't expect customers early on to just want to commit to an entire system, although hopefully in you know, a few years or maybe even a decade, whenever Advantage becomes uh, you know, available for whatever application we're talking about, it makes sense to do that. But for now, you know, we can build a specific processor layout and test it on our cryogenic platform that we already have, and the customer can access it through the cloud. So there's no need to commit to an entire um, system. You can, you know, we can kind of work with you on building prototypes for specific applications. So, you know, this is tying into what I just said. Because naively, building application-specific devices would, would suggest that we would require kind of rebuilding the entire stack. But that's not really true, and that's largely uh, due to the work that we do for building in individual components that are reusable across different applications. Of course, the, even if the specific processor layout is different, the cryogenic platform and the control systems can all be reused or at least reconfigured in an efficient way and deployed for that specific application. So to, to a certain degree, the algorithm and the actual processor and compilation steps that um, you know, compile the high-level description into the fundamental gates, those are all tuned for a specific application. But the... Um, the entire rest of the quantum computer, which we can show you a model of if you visit one of our booths, um, that can be reused across many different applications. So there, there's a lot of steps in you know, getting, uh, getting to where we want to be. So for now, I actually just want to highlight some of the technologies that uh, were, we've built and are continuing to build uh, in order to get to that goal. Uh, so from our uh, cryogenic platform, which I'll show some pictures of soon, uh, we've been able to demonstrate record processor stability. So essentially by worrying you know, about shielding and packaging of the actual processor, we can show that the same identical chip can have much higher coherence times just by essentially simplifying and improving the components that are shielding that chip from interference. If we're going to design many different processors, processor layouts, we better have good software in order to do that. So another aspect of our technology is just our own internal software that lays out the actual chip and optimizes that in order to, for example, reduce things like crosstalk. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the critical steps uh, in being able to run a specific application is compiling down the high-level description into fundamental gates that in turn become pulses. Um, that's also software that we're developing and will be kind of deployed across different applications. Ultimately, we have to tie all these different pieces together, which ties into the co-design methodology. So that's something that will be developed you know, for the next decade as you know, we build out this platform. Finally, we've recently uh, announced that we're working on, um, as I mentioned this a little bit more, a photonic drive, 
which is really the blueprint for scalability. That's what we believe in. Uh, and we're also designing our own um, control electronics and software. Okay, so now I'll just demonstrate a few of the things that I just talked about. Um, so this is actually just an example of the, the software that lays out uh, chips. So in this case, you know, we specify that we want four qubits, and the software actually lays out those four qubits by itself by making use of a specific library of components that have been kind of pre-optimized um, and designed, you know, essentially simulated classically to reduce um, a bunch of interference effects that might affect the performance of the chip. So this is a critical step, of course, in designing and iterating across different chips. Of course, after the layout is done, then the chip still has to be fabricated and tested, and that's what, where a lot of the other components come in. So regarding the uh, shielding and packaging technology that I mentioned earlier, this is actually, this is actually a picture of the uh, dilution refrigerator that is at the Advanced Quantum Test Bed, uh, which is at um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in Berkeley, California. Uh, we, we put that together. I mean, we don't, uh, we don't own that system, but it, we did actually build this system. They're using all our technology, and I'll show some data from that in just a second. Um, but this is what it looks like. Um, we also have some model and some of these pieces in all the Toyota Tsusho booth and our own booth. So if you want to hear more about this, the hardware technology, uh, please reach out. This is really a turnkey solution, meaning that if you're an academic institution that wants to um, just use this technology on your own lab, we can sell that to you and help you set it up. So you know, please reach out uh, if that is something of interest to you. So in addition to the actual um, you know, shielding, another important aspect that's below is the, the circuit boards, which are also critical in improving the processor stability. So here's the actual data that I promised. So um, this was done in that fridge that you just saw. Uh, as you, this is an 8-qubit transmon uh, chip. Uh, and what we did there is in four different cooldowns, uh, we, we had different shielding and packaging around the chip. And then we measured T1 times, the coherence time of each individual qubit on those, on those different cooldowns. The, the first one on the left has no shielding, essentially. And then the next two are the, that's the solution that the, um, the lab was using before we came in. Uh, and the last one is with our shielding and packaging technology. And you can see there is essentially an order of magnitude improvement in T1 time across every single qubit. OK, so. The, the, another aspect that I mentioned was the photonic control. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, a dilution refrigerator, there is a bunch of cables kind of lying around, which of course uh, is, a pro is problematic because this thing is trying to cool the chip down to extremely low temperatures, and the cooling power is not, not high enough to do that efficiently. So if you imagine scaling up to more qubits, you need to control those extra qubits, so you need more cables. Uh, that is a big issue, in fact, for scalability. So one of the things that we're working on is essentially a photonic control chip that allows us to dramatically reduce all those cables by uh, sending light pulses instead uh, down the fridge, which dramatically improves the, um, you know, the <laughs> It reduces the cooling that's needed, which allows us, in turn, to essentially scale beyond 100 qubits. Because uh, on the current largest fridges, one of the problems is how do you cool a system that can control more than 100 qubits? So we're currently working on this uh, photonic control chip that um, will allow us to scale beyond that. And this is, um, you know, this is essentially just. Um, our hope for how we can scale even beyond that. Um, but even with photonic control, it's still quite difficult to fit more than 1,000 qubits. 
So if we're going to build systems with millions, maybe billions of qubits one day, uh, then it's likely that we will be a we'll have to essentially interconnect uh, between different uh, chips, and this photonic control also allows us to do that. So in addition to just improving the um, the control for one particular fridge, we also see that as really uh, the blueprint for how we can go uh, into fault-tolerant devices. Um, so I'll end here. Um, I will also just maybe remind you that, um, like I said, we're a fault-tolerant company. We do build, sorry, <laughs> we're a full-stack company, apologies. Uh, we do build uh, hardware, but we also work on algorithms and applications. Uh, there is no need to, you know, buy an entire system, we're happy to essentially test out uh, applications on smaller chips that you can access, um, you know, through our own facility. Um, and, you know, just feel free to reach out and if you want to learn more. Thank you. Thank you.